Welcome everyone uh, to HBI virtual conversation. My name is Lisa. I am the director of the Hadassah Brandeis University of Jewish Studies and Women's and Gender Studies. We do this through a variety of programs, including teaching, publication, residential fellowships, and student internships at Brandeis. We also provide research awards that support scholars writing about Jewish women at institutions around the world. HBI Virtual Conversations is our public program that allows us to share important new scholarship and ideas in Jewish women's and gender studies outside the academy. HBI's programs are funded by generous gifts from people like you. In honor of Mother's Day, uh, I ask you to consider making other in your life a friend of HBI with a gift of 180. Uh, HBI will be producing 50 free programs in total this year. You'll find a link in the chat to uh, make a donation and also in a follow-up email. Before we start, a few words about today's Zoom logistics. Please use the speaker view for the best viewing. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions using the chat function. You can do that at any time. We will not be unmuting people to ask questions during the formal part of the program, but we all will be staying on for an additional half hour at the end where we will meet up in chat rooms and you can address your questions and comments directly to the authors. Uh, please also know that we're recording this event and we'll post it on our website early next week. And there is an automatic transcript, which you can adjust as you wish at the bottom of the screen. I'm very happy today to introduce my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Nora Gold. Uh, HBI gives out research awards in the field of Jewish women's and gender studies. And in order to do that, we have to uh, have them reviewed by experts from around the world and for many years, Dr. Nora Gold has been a valued member of HBI's Academic Advisory Committee, reviewing proposals in Jewish women's fiction and creative writing. Um, she is a prize-winning writer and activist. Her first book, Marrow and Other Stories, praise from Alice Monroe, After My Own Heart, I'm a hometown girl from Toronto. <laughs> Uh, her second book, Fields of Exile, a novel about anti-Semitism on campus, won a Canadian Jewish Literary Award, and praise from Erwin Kotler, Ruth Wiss, and Cynthia Ozick. And her latest novel, The Dead Hand, received international acclaim and was published in Hebrew in Israel. Gold is also the founder and editor of the prestigious online literary journal, jewishfiction.net, which is celebrating its first 10 years and has published during that time over 450 works of Jewish fiction never before published in English, which were either written in English or translated into English from 15 languages. The journal is free and available to all. At one time, a tenured social work professor, Gold is also an activist who founded or co-founded three progressive Zionist organizations in Canada. She holds both Canadian and Israeli citizenship and spends four months a year in Jerusalem. Dr. Gold will be joined by Israel Nora Kuri Haim and American author Diane Lederman, who will share their work. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Gold and stay on. And our thank you very much, Lisa, for this very kind introduction. And thanks also to you and Terry and the Hadassah Brandeis Institute for hosting this event. I have such respect for the work you do, and it's really an honor to be here. The Hadassah Brandeis Institute is, to my mind, a very important organization, absolutely unique in the role it plays in supporting and fostering Jewish feminist work, both academic scholarship and projects in the creative arts, including writing. There's nothing like it anywhere. It is a hub and a beacon for Jewish feminists internationally, and it's wonderful to serve on your academic advisory committee. So, Thank you. I'd also like to thank the two Israeli consulates for their co-sponsorship. The consul in Toronto and Western Canada and New England. And thanks to all of you who've joined us today. As today's event is part of JewishFiction.net celebrations of its 10th year anniversary. 
And for those of you not yet familiar with our journal, we're the only English language journal in the world, either print or online, devoted exclusively to publishing Jewish fiction. And we have readers in 140 countries. Jewishfiction.net is completely independent of any organization or funder, and we rely entirely on donations from our readers. We're very grateful to them that with their support, we've been able to keep our journal free of charge for everyone. And we always appreciate donations of any size. I started Jewishfiction.net because about 10 or 15 years ago, the advent of digital technology began making it harder for many writers to get their work published, especially if their writing was niche market as Jewish fiction is considered. I was not struggling myself as a writer, but I became concerned about some fine Jewish women writers I knew who couldn't find a home for their books. So JewishFiction.net was created to make a space for first-rate Jewish fiction by authors who were not yet well-known. I also wanted JewishFiction.net to address another socio-cultural problem. For decades, I've been very concerned about the increasing polarization within the Jewish world, for example, between left and right, religious and secular, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, and more. And I wanted there to be a place where all Jewish voices could be heard and hear each other. And as part of this, because I'm both Canadian and Israeli, as you heard, I wanted to build a bridge between Israel, Israel, Israeli and diaspora Jews. So JewishFiction.net is very inclusive and features stories by writers of all backgrounds and perspectives. We also publish in each issue at least three stories by Israeli writers translated from Hebrew in order to foster diaspora Jews' appreciation for the richness of Israeli literature. Each issue we publish, and we've just put out our 26th issue, is a mixture of new writers and those who are already very well known. For example, we've published such eminent authors as Elie Wiesel, Nava Semel, Aaron Appelfeld, Chava Rosenfarb, Olive Beit Yoshua, and Tova Mervis, to name just a few. JewishFiction.net has a distinguished advisory council and a brilliant team of volunteers with reviewer hubs in three countries, and these are currently located in Houston, Toronto, and Jerusalem. Without all of these amazing reviewers over these past 10 years, this journal could not have been produced. So my deepest gratitude to all of them, and a special thank you to our fabulous current reviewers, Julia Mazo, Carol Ricker, Bernice Heilbrunn, Charlotte Berkowitz, and Sheila Deutsch. This June will be publishing for the second time an all women's issue, so look out for it. And if you wish to get notified about it, please join our mailing list. Also, if you're part of a book club, be in touch with us. There are various book clubs that use JewishFiction.net stories, and they read two or three of them at each meeting. Now a few words about Jewish women's writing. When some people hear the phrase Jewish women writer, they picture a woman who is white, born Jewish, and writing in the English language, usually American, and also probably Ashkenazi, heterosexual, middle class, physically able, and not old. In fact, though, Jewish women writers are diverse in color, birth religion, sexual orientation, ethnic background language, and more. Since at JewishFiction.net, we have published women's writing translated from 15 languages, French, Danish, Spanish, Italian, Serbian, Croatian, German, Russian, Romanian, Turkish, Polish, Hungarian, Yiddish, Judeo-Spanish, and Hebrew, it would be possible to discuss Jewish women's fiction in each of these languages by itself. For example, the work of Jewish women writers is its own entire field. So is the field of Israeli women's writing. Ditto for Jewish women authors in South America who write in Spanish, etc. For me, one of the great joys of this journal has been discovering the rich diversity of Jewish fiction from around the world, and at the same time seeing the core elements that unite these works. So it is possible to make some general remarks about Jewish women writers, but please remain cognizant that this is not a monolithic group and that these writers are diverse not only linguistically and ethnically, but in multiple other ways. So what do Jewish women writers write about? What are some of the central themes and concerns they express in their fiction? Like any other writer, male or female, Jewish or non-Jewish, Jewish women writers write about life, death, loss, marriage, divorce, illness, finances, family conflict, the creative process, relationships, politics, nature, food, 
In other words, anything and everything. And like non-Jewish women writers, this everything includes writing about their lives as women. This includes topics like women's bodies, women's roles, violence against women, friendships between women, sexuality, and resistance, both personal and political. And when Jewish women writers explore such themes, they often do so through a specifically Jewish lens. For instance, the issue of women's bodies in Jewish women's writing can include stories about Jewish modesty and behavior or dress, nida, Jewish purity laws, or one's relationship to the mikvah. Not all Jewish women writers, obviously, are feminists, but whether implicitly or explicitly, their work reflects the awareness that they are women, and as such that they are living their lives within a certain social context and structure, one that feminists characterize as patriarchal and sexist. In addition to being conscious of themselves as women, Jewish women writers are aware of themselves as Jews. Their Jewish identities, whether these are ethnic, religious, or both, are reflected in their fiction as having various beautiful and positive aspects. But when writing about themselves as Jews in the larger world, Jewish women's fiction also reflects the anti-Semitism in the world around them, along with the sexism that is there too. For Jewish women writers who are women of color or LGBTQ, for instance, their writing reflects also their struggles with racism or homophobia, both within the Jewish community and beyond. And ditto for every other kind of otherness experienced by a Jewish woman writer. At the same time, much of Jewish women's writing reflects very positively on the experience of being a Jewish woman. We can see in their stories great pride in Jewish women's strength, resilience, history, intellect, power, and sisterhood. We also see there a challenging and critiquing of assumptions or negative stereotypes about Jewish women, such as the stereotypical Jewish mother. Mm -hmm. Judith Lewin, who teaches Jewish women's literature at Union College, emphasizes this theme of challenge and critique and focuses her classes on themes like Jewish women's intersecting nationalities, Jewish women who are culturally other, like Russian Jewish immigrants, Jewish heteronormativity, and gendered relations with traditional Judaism. All the themes I've mentioned so far appear in the hundreds of Jewish women's stories that we've published in JewishFiction.net. These stories are also about personal and family crises, motherhood, the Holocaust, intermarriage, Israel, aging, and one's relationship to Jewish traditions in the Jewish community, including feelings of non-belonging and alienation. The title of today's program is Exploring Jewish Women's Fiction as Mirrors into Jewish Women's Lives. So how does this fiction mirror the lives of real Jewish women? We'll talk about this soon with our two guest authors, but for now, I will offer one example. A few years after starting JewishFiction.net, I noticed that we were publishing a surprising number of stories about mikvahs. Curious, I examined these stories as a group and discovered that out of the eight mikvah-themed stories that we had published till then, six of them, that's three quarters, had ended in what I termed mikvah suicides. In other words, women drowning themselves committing suicide in a mikvah. For instance, in the story, Total Immersion, Bruria, a young Orthodox woman got, pressure, woman, got pressured into marrying a man twice her age who physically repulsed her. After three months of beatings, forced sex, and being refused a divorce, Bruria commits suicide by drowning herself in a mikvah. The other five stories in this group of six ended the same way. I was shocked to see this, especially since this phenomenon was one I'd never heard of in real life. Now, obviously, literature is not a direct reflection of real life. The kind of knowledge one gains through literature is different from the kind acquired, say, through social science research, which I used to conduct. But fiction does provide important information and valuable knowledge. And it seemed unlikely to me that it was just coincidental and meaningless that we'd gotten story after story about women trapped in abusive marital situations who considered a mikvah suicide as their only way out. This seemed to reflect to me some aspect of a collective experience. I won't delve here into its various possible meanings. If you're interested, you can read my blog on this topic at my website, noragold.com, which was published in Haaretz and the Forward. 
I mention this phenomenon of Nick the suicide stories only as an example of how Jewish women's fiction might be a mirror into some real women's lives. And it's interesting that not long after, after, not long after I noticed this pattern, the mikvah became front page news throughout the Jewish world due to the Barry Frangel scandal, when this Washington rabbi, rabbi placed a hidden camera in a mikvah to film the naked women converts there. Soon after that, there was yet another convergence between these six stories and my life. I was invited to give a talk during the intermission of a play that was going to be performed. This play was called Mikvah and it was an Israeli work by Hadar Galron that had been translated from Hebrew into English. So in order to prepare for my talk, I read this play, and guess how it ended? In a mikvah suicide. On a happier note, though, there have been other stories in JewishFiction.net about mikvahs that are very positive in tone. For instance, there are two beautiful stories set in mikvahs, one called Ritual Bath and the other Manya's Story, which portray an admiring, even grateful perspective on the mikveh. In each of these stories, the female attendant in the mikveh helps a vulnerable young woman in distress, one struggling with a history of incest, the other with sexual problems in her marriage. So this is just one example of how fiction can act as a mirror into Jewish women's lives. It's important to say though, that the relationship between fiction and reality is a very complex one. Fiction is not, as some people think, just autobiography in disguise. Fiction is, however, a place where writers can try out new ideas, solutions, and alternatives to their lives, which sometimes they cannot or dare not explore in reality. For instance, there's the whole field of women's utopian fiction, which expresses women writers' dreams and fantasies for a better world, often a just, egalitarian, feminist, and matriarchal one. So literature can be not only descriptive, but aspirational, a place to sketch out and flesh out one's dreams, a place to say the unsayable. So in this sense, writing fiction can be a subversive act. In my view, this gives fiction a special power because it not only reflects deep truths about reality, it has the potential to shape and alter reality. It therefore can be a form of tikkun olam, repairing the world. Because what happens when you read fiction is that you learn about yourself, but you also learn about other people, other cultures, places, experiences that normally would be distant from your own. In literary fiction, you meet the other. So this kind of writing introduces us in an intimate way to otherness and differentness, and therefore increases our capacity for empathy and tolerance. There's actually research by Keith Oatley and Raymond Marr, for instance, showing that when you read good fiction, it changes you emotionally and even neurologically. On a personal note, I was told that my novel, Fields of Exile, changed the attitudes of some non-Jews who, before reading that book, had held very hostile views toward Jews and Israel. So fiction really can change people. And I think it does this by acting as a kind of magic mirror that doesn't just show you back your own self, but alters it. Now let's hear some good fiction and meet our guest authors and their stories. I picked these two stories out of all the ones in our current issue because of certain similarities between them. Also because having an American story and an Israeli one will allow us to discuss among other things, cultural differences, and because of what these stories tell us about Jewish women's lives. Diane Letterman lives in Hadley, Massachusetts with her partner Donna Kahn. She's been writing fiction for three decades and was a reporter for more than 40 years before switching to fiction writing full-time. Diane's story, Worthy Editor, is part of an unpublished novel. This story in JewishFiction.net is Diane's first published fiction. And it is always a delight for us to be an author's first publication, something we have been numerous times, and in this way, we help to encourage a new writer. Nora Hori Chaim was born in Tel Aviv to parents who'd made Aliyah from Iraq. She spent her childhood surrounded by a huge extended family and grew up on the knees of her aunts and uncles, listening to stories from the old country. These stories were in sharp contrast to the, re contrast to the reality around her. In the fledgling state of Israel, anything foreign, and especially anything connected to the Arab world, was frowned upon. 
This dissonance defined Nora's childhood and inspired her writing as an adult. Nora did an MA with honors in literature and creative writing at Ben Gurion University. Her first novel, Cover Me with Izzer, was nominated for the Sapir Prize and praised by the National Library of Israel. This novel has not yet been translated into English, but Nora's story, Serach, in JewishFiction.net, is an excerpt from that novel. This story was translated into English by Yaron Regev. Thank you, Yaron, and thank you all the translators whose work appears in our journal. Without you, none of us would have access to these gems of world literature. Now Diane and Nora will each read a brief excerpt from their stories to give you some flavor for their writing. Diane, would you like to start? Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Um, this is called Worthy Editor. Shauna Spector sighed with quiet joy when she spotted the ferverts hanging crisply as if ironed on a library rack. The Yiddish pages were as comforting as the smell of the challah her mother used to bake for Sabbath in their home in Kishniev. Reading the paper would take her back. She was so thankful that Ori brought her to this library soon after she and Lev settled in New Bedford. You will enjoy this paper very much, especially the letters. Very interesting stories, her husband's cousin told her. It's not easy being away from what we know. The paper is like having talks with a dear friend. Lev did not need such a friend. After just one night, he said, New Bedford already felt like home. Shana didn't understand how it could become that more quickly than the time it took to make sauerkraut. He felt even lonelier after those words came from his mouth. Everything is so much better here, he had scolded, yet you complain. If you can't talk to people, study harder. He said dismissive, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Diane. Nora, your turn. No, it will never happen. Serach signs and throws the last kubbe dumpling into the pot. Why would he die? Why? Is his life so bad? Has he ever worked a single day in his life? She's the one who has to do everything. She's the one who gets up at four every morning to open the grocery store and get the milk bottles. Then she spends the whole day on her feet, working. And even now, what is he doing? Sitting behind the cash register, reading a newspaper or taking a nap? And he will walk only when he hears a female voice. Uri, get me some milk. Or Uri, get me some challah. Then the bald patch on his head will start gleaming and his red eyes always bulging because of his thyroid gland will get even bigger. Why doesn't he ever walk up when the school children come in and say, Uri, get me some bubble gum, then try to sweep a popsicle from the refrigerator outside. She feels like she needs to keep 500 eyes peeled for these thieves. And how can she be inside the grocery store and outside at the same time? Only the Iraqi clients know his name is Sabah. The Ashkenazim call him Uri, which was what they had changed his name to at the airport when the two of them made Aliyah. They had wanted her to change her name to Esther, like the queen, but she wouldn't have it. From the day she'd been born, she had been a slave, not a queen. It had been 15 years ago, when she was 50, that the children who were already grown had surprised her and sent her on her own vacation to the Dead Sea, all on her own. She remembers floating on the salty water as though her whole body was in a barrel of oil, like the barrels the stinking herring came in, the ones they brought to the grocery store for the Ashkenazi customers. It was then that she decided that was that. He would never die on his own and she would have to do something herself if she wanted to get rid of him. All through the three days she spent at the Dead Sea, she kept thinking and thinking. 
until finally she decided what to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nora. Well, let's be begin our conversation um, by my asking you, each of you, uh, what inspired you to write this particular story? And let's start with you, Diane. I'm gonna see if I can show you all a visual aid. Um, this actually, I don't know if you can see this photograph. This is my um, grand, my, my grandmother, my grandfather and her five sons. And they came over from Russia and they, they died when I was only seven and they didn't speak very, they, their English was um, Polish and Russian. And so my grandmother especially didn't speak um, very much, but she was a curious character, even though I was so young, she was this little person and she had all these men around her in her life. And I found out later that she actually was participating in a strike in Russia, tobacco, she worked in a tobacco factory and she was in the sense of this feisty woman just, just got me started. So it, there's this whole novel and it's completely imaginary, but just, I kind of wanted to know like what it was like for her and for other immigrants to come when maybe they didn't want to come and were forced into situations that were, they had to really kind of react and make a life for themselves. And especially when their marriage wasn't necessarily so supportive. Very interesting. So much fiction, so much Jewish women's fiction is inspired by mothers or grandmothers, great grandmothers, and you're part of a real tradition there. Nora, what inspired you? Yeah, I, I think uh, I felt the same because I, w I was born in Israel and my pa grandparents and parents and all the family uh, came from Iraq. Uh, they made Aliyah in the early 50s and uh, I just heard stories and the stories, their stories were so vivid. Uh, I almost uh, could uh, place myself there. And uh, in the process of writing, I recreate their world. And uh, it made me understand, uh, it made me understand uh, what molded their, their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second reason I think it's uh, that uh, the Babylonian uh, Jew Jewish uh, community in Iraq uh, uh, existed uh, approximately 2,500 years. And uh, in uh, the Aliyah, in, it, it's still when I, I was child, uh, when, uh, throughout my child, childhood, uh, they still uh, kept the tradition, the unique uh, Arabic uh, dia Jewish dialect, like the Yiddish and the, the culture, but uh, in time it, it disappeared uh, because uh, the old generation passed on. And I felt that I want to, uh, to leave a record to the younger generation that they will uh, know their forebears, know what uh, they experienced and accomplished uh, in their lives. And it was uh, very, uh, it, it, these two things motivated me to write. It's so interesting. Our next question, my next question to both of you is going to be about similarities and differences between your stories. But I mean, we already see the, the uh, inspiration from your family's histories and immigrations, emigrations, immigrations. And Nora, behind you, I even see pictures. I'm not embarrassing you, but they look like, no, you certainly don't have to share them. But <laughs> I see also oh, family oh, photos. <laughs> From the old country, right? Yeah. yeah this is yeah. the old country. This is the family. Yeah. I love these photos. <laughs> um, well, Nora, what, let's uh, jump to the similarities between your two stories. Uh, we'll talk about differences in a minute, but your reaction to Diane's story and your thoughts about the overlaps. I, yeah, I, I, I see a lot say, of similarities, even though the places and times were different but they both uh, uh, went through a pogrom. Uh, Diane, uh, Diane's a hero, heroine, uh, even I, I think she is a 
PTSD. And uh, she was raped or something, I think. And uh, they are both in a very miserable marriage. And their, their husband uh, are liars, betray, 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 betrays, and, um, and they, they are indifferent to their struggles. They, they both are, are, feel alienated and lonely in a foreign, foreign country they forced to, to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, this is the similar, the, I, see, I, I see a, a, a parallel lines between them two. What Diane. do you see, Diane? Yeah, Diane. Um, I was, I, that's, that's, I agree with that and I'll speak to differences. Um, Lev, unlike um, Sabari, um, is he's blinded by his future. Like he's determined to be successful. And so he's so caught up in his wanting to open a business and he sees that's the American dream and that would give him success and give him value that that eclipses him from seeing his wife who's kind of, he sees as someone who should be supporting him and not getting in his way and you your um saba is much more um the person taking care of the family and has this kind of you know this drag of a husband who doesn't contribute at all so i mean it's just it's interesting to see that they're both in unhappy places i think the two women should go off together so, <laughs> and um you know, enjoy life, you know, and laugh and just appreciate each other and um, they have some good things to share. Yeah, but because they are, both of them ruled by, by men. They are bo both uh, experience a patriarchal uh, society and the chauvinist uh, behavior towards them. Uh, even I, I, I can say uh, uh, mentally abused. <laughs> Uh, Absolutely. Your your uh, your uh, uh, character. You have the husband of Shuna. He's uh, he's abusive. He doesn't. Uh, he has no compassion towards her at all. I think the parallels between the two are very, uh, very, very striking. And one thing that hasn't been said yet is that both women actually have hope because women who don't have hope don't make a plan. And yes. both of these women not only make a plan, but they institute a plan, they implement it. So they're resourceful women, they're strong women, they have a sense of self-worth despite the despite. abuse of the husbands, which makes them in some ways very admirable, I think. That's right. Yeah. No. Well, sure. I don't know if the a wealthy, wealthy editor will help her, but she <laughs> has hope. Well, yes, that's right. We don't know the outcome in either case, exactly. But, but we hope for both these women. Yes. Now, one, one obvious difference between the stories, and Diane, you've touched on this a little bit, is that they're set in different times and places. And what do you think, now I'm interested in the cultural and social differences, because we have an Israeli writer and an American writer. Um, Diane, what do you think is unique about writing as an American in the American social context? And afterwards, Nora, I'll ask you the same question about being an Israeli writer in the Israeli context. I think I have American history kind of the frame in a way, like the, the various, all, most of the work that I've been, this is like my fifth novel, I think that I've been working on and they're set in different periods of history. And so as an American writer, I kind of mix the historical piece, because I love the way history can show us our now. Yeah. And also, um, so I think that's where, where it comes from, just this fascination with like, how are we here? What brought us here? And mm -hmm. how can we make things better? Mm -hmm. Nora, what's it like being an Israeli writer? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because um, I was born in Israel and uh, my whole life I uh, lived in Israel and I grew up in the 60s. And to grow up in the 60s in Israel, it was very, very special. 
because um, it was a newborn kind of state and everything that happened uh, was novel. And we, uh, we felt that we are a miracle that happened to our people. And uh, we had a uh, sense uh, of uh, security, secure. We, we have, um, yeah, authentic sense uh, of secure. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a, it is a real uh, unique experience. To be uh, uh, to be Israeli in those times, mm -hmm. but uh, nevertheless, I had, my roots were were in Iraq, mm -hmm. in a, a, an enemy state, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I through my uh, childhood I heard the language, the Arabic language, the we uh, celebrated the, uh, as they celebrated the, in the, their homeland. So I grew conflicted because I was, as my generation, against the experience of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, there is no such thing as 100% Israeli. No. Absolutely not. And it's no. so interesting because they're both immigrant stories. And of course, there's so many immigrants, you know, to draw a parallel to Diane here, even though, um, you know, the Yiddish speaking countries weren't enemy countries of America. Many immigrants were ashamed to speak Yiddish or ashamed of their poor English or ashamed of their previous identity. In the, ca in the case you described, Nora, of course, it's different because of the contempt for the Arabic language and Arabic culture as a whole. Yes. I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, the whole question of what Jewish women's fiction can teach us about Jewish women's lives. Um, not, not only in terms of this specific story that each of your stories that we're discussing, um, but that too, but also in general, how do you think about the context of families, communities, and cultures, and how they reflect the lives of, of real women? Let's start with you, not real women in the sense of the movement called real women, I mean, <laughs> real life women. Diane, why don't you begin? Um, you know, it's funny, I don't, I don't think of um, that in a kind of intellectual way. I think the stories kind of come through and bring that forward. Um, and I think, you know, we, the Jewish piece of it is that I am not necessarily like super religious, but culturally it's just there. And so I think given all of that, it kind of comes through just because of who I am. I'll just tell you, I was working on a novel once and there were no Jewish characters in there. And I couldn't quite figure out, I, I wanted to explore what that was like and I couldn't get there. And it wasn't that I haven't written from different perspectives you know I write men and boys and so it's not that it was just that my heart couldn't connect in a way that was non-verbal it just I think was missing sort of that sort of spiritual connection somehow so I think that's how my work kind of um becomes sort of the embodiment of what I'm kind of feeling rather than thinking mm -hmm. interesting Nora what are your thoughts about that what, uh, not about what Diane said, but the question of Jewish women's lives and how fiction can relate to them. They can identify, they can find themselves in the stories mm -hmm. uh, in that way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe uh, they can uh, recreate new life for themselves. Uh, you mean learn from the stories in a yes, way? in a way. Well, I wonder after reading both of your stories, you know, on that back to the question of hope, you know, someone reading your story might get an idea, Nora or Diane, and say, you know, maybe I don't have to just endure this. I mean, I think there are so many ways that fiction change, as I've already said, 
changes people and opens their minds and opens their understanding. I mean, you think it's possible somebody could read one of your stories and look at their lives differently? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I think sometimes a seed could be planted or it may not even happen right away, but you could sort of, I don't know, I, I come back to fictional characters and thinking about how they kind of negotiate the world. And it may not be right there, but I, there's just something about, fiction is like one of the most intimate things you can do without mm -hmm. another person. You know, I mean, you are connecting in a way that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it can kind of touch you in a way that might, alter the course slightly at mm -hmm. some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how being a Jewish woman intersects for each of you with other aspects of your identities. You know, we've talked a little bit about that in terms of what inspired your stories, but ethnic, religious, sexual, anyway, how, how do your other aspects of your identity express themselves in your writing? Um, Nora, do you want to start? Yeah, I, this is an interesting issue for me because I, I live, a, I am a Jew in a, I, and I live in a majority. Major, in, in the state of Israel, we are the majority. Right. So, you know, I can be secular and uh, still uh, uh, f uh, enjoy the, the holiday without being uh, religious or something like that. I, I don't have to uh, differ differentiate um, my, myself uh, from the environment to feel a uh, Jew mm -hmm. uh, as in the diaspora, because in the diaspora, for example, Yom Kippur in England, I, 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 was, I visited my brother's family in England. Uh, you, you, if you don't uh, make uh, if you don't choose to be a Jew, if you don't choose to be, you, you, you can't, you assimilate. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't have uh, this kind of um, conflict uh, because, you know, I, I, I'm a Jew and this is a, this natural to me. Mm -hmm. Diane. Well, you know, it's funny. I um, was been watching Stissel, which I'm sure you all been watching and been amazed at how what life would be like just being in a Jewish culture, you know, growing up. Um, there were, you know, obviously we had temples and things, but it was clearly that we were other. And especially I grew up in the 60s also, so there wasn't that sense of real belonging. And so I think it gives you a different, I, I kind of, um, I'm in awe of sort of being able to be Jewish in a way that people understand you. I know when I go to book events or other places and there's kind of a, you meet another, like I find if you meet a Jewish book person, you're home. You know, you have this ultimately amazing connection because you understand in a nonverbal way again of how you relate to the world. And I, I kind of love that, even though again, it's not articulated, there's just something kind of soulful about Jewish readers and people that are part of the world in that way. And also if they like baseball, you know, that's just one. <laughs> a baseball lover. Mm -hmm. well, well, now we're talking about, we only have a few minutes till we um, move on to question Q and A, but you're talking about Jewish identity and women's identity. Do you think there's such a thing as women's writing, Jewish writing, Jewish women's writing? Um, and that's a big enough question, but the, the tag question on it is, is there anything that you see as distinctly female and or Jewish about your own writing, uh, not only restricted to the specific stories we're discussing? Nora? Yes, I, I, I think there is such things because a writer a, writes about his inner self, and uh, he he writes about what he what what's around him, and they, uh, I'm a Jew and a woman, so 
this, uh, this is what defined me. And I write through these uh, um, identities. But I want to think that uh, in writing, uh, uh, there is something universal. Uh, because when I, I write about uh, difficulties in marriage or, uh, or uh, difficulties, hardship of immigration, there are many men and women all over the world that can identify with it. Of course. And, and, not, and not only Jewish, because uh, America itself is an immigration country. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are, are uh, people who came from India and they uh, feel the same uh, difficulties as Jews who came from uh, Iraq to Israel. This is a, you know, a human, uh, human being uh, experiences. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that we write as, as Jewish women because that's who we are. Yes. But at the same time, the, the themes and everything else are, I mean, I hope that are much more human. Yeah. And there's so much literature out there right now that's amazing. I'm just so, gra I gravitate towards like co different cultures and trying to understand their place in the world. And I, I appreciate their stories, but because they're so universal. And so I sort of see you stay authentic to your story and it becomes universal, hopefully. And that other, you know, all people can relate to that and sort of understand their common humanity. Well, we don't have time to get into a, another question, but just you're touching on a question that maybe some other time uh, there will be a conversation about, and that is uh, one self-definition as a Jewish woman writer. You know, uh, Margaret Atwood refuses to be called a woman's writer, a woman writer, and Saul Bellow refused to be called a Jewish writer, and so forth. And then there are many people who have really embrace this identification. I, I'm very comfortable being a Jewish woman, a Canadian Jewish woman writer. I mean, you can keep tagging on more and more adjectives. And of course, having the specificity um, of identity does not negate the universalism, right? So somebody, an Indian, a male Indian writer is male, you know, maybe writing about India. And of course, of course, the humanity of everything is essential. Uh, a last question, which, uh, yeah, we have a couple of minutes before Q&A, and actually this was one of the Q&A questions, so, and it was one of my questions, which is um, what you're working on now. Uh, Nora, are you writing something at present, or you're in between things? No, I, I'm writing a new novel, a stories a, about women, yeah. all of them. Women. Yeah. Women in a very um, poor neighborhood in Israel, uh, they uh, fighting through, fighting their way through life um, and struggle. And uh, very strong women, women, uh, which related the uh, uh, family connections, uh, friend, their friend, uh, one with each other. Mm. And that's what I'm writing now. And like because, because I write about the 60s, I have to uh, go to the library and uh, make uh, research. And I have it in the Babylonian uh, uh, Jewry uh, Heritage Center that we have in Or Yehuda. Oh, how wonderful. A museum, wonderful museum. I warmly recommend to go and visit when COVID-19 will leave <laughs> and uh, the world will, will return to itself. So uh, there, were, there, there is a, a huge library of uh, mu uh, the, mu the music of uh, the Jews in uh, uh, Iraq and the uh, photographs and the uh, books, great. 
I'm always so delighted when somebody talks about going to a library yeah. or a physical space and they don't just do all their research on internet. I met a college student who had, was in fourth year at his university and had never set foot in the library. And it was one of the best libraries in Canada. And he said, why should I? Well, that's a whole other topic, writers and libraries. Um, Diane, your thoughts on this? What are you working on, if anything? Yeah, no, I am. Um, actually, I was even working this morning on this. I am working on a story. It's, again, dealing with immigrants, but it uh, opens with a murder. And it's not so much about the murder. It's more about how this affects the whole, all the people that knew this, this, this Jewish refugee from Russia and how she came over to this country to escape. And she married a, a, a sort of a non-Jewish man who just adored her, sort of different than my characters now, but how her death, you kind of learn more about her as people are trying to figure out what happened. And other people are so affected by this because it was in an apartment building, you know, a, a multicultural apartment building in, in Roxbury. Massachusetts and so it's looks at various threads of what life was like in 1907 which was fascinating because that you read a lot about um, automobiles and horses having accidents and um, I just I'm amazed and the, the Boston Globe archive it was just like my my bible it records it writes about every little thing and the other thing that i'm fascinated by there were so many suicides then i mean every day there'd be four five six suicides of different ages and it's wow. like so what was going on at that time so that kind of mm -hmm. all filters into this novel mm -hmm. yeah your interest in history i can't wait to read what both of you are working on now well some more questions from the chat that was one of them um Here's a question. Sometimes when I read Jewish fiction, there are only modest ties to anything distinctively Jewish. In your writing, is it a challenge to imbue your characters and settings with differences that identify them as Jewish? I think you've both commented a little bit on the fact that it's intrinsic for you, but do you have anything to say about an effort? And I do know that some Jewish writers actually are very conscious of the marketing game and not so much in Israel, but in North America. Um, are you aiming this book at a Jewish market or a not Jewish market and how Jewish do you want to be or not? Anyway, whatever, do either of you have a comment on this, on this question? I, I'm, I'm not writing to, I come to I, I've been writing for so long and kind of in this, I just love the process of writing that I don't really think about the end of where it will end up. I mean, um, I think I started turning um, this novel, the one that's set in New Bedford into short stories as a way to kind of get it out there um, a little bit to sort of see, but I think I'm gonna actually go back and finish it as, you know, make it as, as good as a novel as it can be. So um, I think that um, that sort of, I just lost the, my train went out the window <laughs> here. Um. I have one. I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. That, um, we've a third question from the chat area. And um, Nora, you take a stab at this one. Um, after you finish writing a book, do you miss your characters? Uh, Nora. I, I only I only wrote one book, <laughs> and I miss I, I miss the characters because. It based on real ones. So I missed my parents, I missed my grandparents, I missed uh, my aunts, some, you know, and uh, yeah. Uh, I have to say, sometimes I feel the char my characters are still with me. They're still alive, yeah. and they're still with me. I'll go to a place where they went and I'm re-experience what they experience it and it's yeah, not it's something true. I experienced, right? <laughs> this is the wonderful, in writing because uh, in the process and and when you you write it down you recreate the world their world and you the, you leave them yes. they 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 still they still is they still here with us diane any very quick response yeah, before we I, pass I, it back I, to lisa I, I, I sometimes will wonder what, you know, a character that I've been working on has been doing. And I'm going to revisit yet another book and I'm, because I want to know what they've been up to. So, yes. 
Thank you. I think it's back to Lisa at this point. Hey, wow, what a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful discussion. Um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Nora, for organizing it. And thank you, uh, Nora and Diane for <laughs> speaking so uh, heartfeltly about your work. For those of you who are able to stay on, we're gonna continue this discussion in a more informal way. We're going to break into rooms and have some more informal chats. Before we do that, I just want to tell you about some upcoming events here at HBI in our online space. Um, on May 12th, we'll be having the launch of the newest volume of our journal, Nashim, a journal of women's and gender studies that we publish with the Schechter Institute in Israel. The topic of the volume is new feminist ethnography. Um, so if, you're in, if you read novels in order to understand Jewish women's lives in other parts of the world, you might enjoy ethnography, which is another way of coming at it through the social sciences. The title of the event is Pressing Feminist Agendas, New Reports from the Field. And it will be moderated by Professor Vanessa Oakes, who is the editor of this special issue. Um, on May 13th, we're going to be having another discussion about Jewish women's writing, but this is about uh, sort of lost novels of the early 20th century. Uh, Professor Lori Harrison Kahan and Jessica Kurzane are going to be talking about the project of recovering lost Jewish women's novels, and in particular talking about their work in bringing back to our attention the work of Emma Wolfe, who wrote a novel in the early 20th century uh, set in uh, the Los Angeles Jewish community, and Jessica Kurzane uh, about translating a novel originally published in Yiddish about the life of a young woman at the turn of the century in New York. Uh, so that's on May 13th, and it's called Rediscovering the Lost Literature of Unconventional Jewish Women. And that will be followed by a friend raiser where you can hear more about HBI and uh, the work we do to make all this uh, scholarship possible. Uh, so that's the end of the formal program and please stay on and it'll take us a few minutes to distribute everyone into groups, but we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you so much, Nora and Diane. You were great guests. Thank you. Thank you. It was great fun. <laughs>